I want to thank uh, our uh, community for joining us today. Um, this is the Myeloid Network <clears> that was founded by uh, five uh, professors uh, shown here. And um, together we organize monthly seminars and we're organizing a conference at the Society for Immunotherapy of Cancer annual meeting in November. I want to uh, express our support, our, our appreciation, sorry, for our sponsors, UC San Diego Morris Cancer Center, AstraZeneca and Charisma Therapeutics for their generous support of the Myeloid Network. So thank you. I want to take a few minutes to, uh, to, to tell you about the passing of one of the stars of the of myeloid research, Jeff Pollard. Jeff uh, passed away peacefully from cancer uh, last week. He was a professor of resilience biology at the College of Medicine and Veterinary Medicine at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. He was there for a decade uh, leading the Medical Research Council Center for Reproductive Health. And um, he was founder of companies to develop uh, myeloid targeted therapeutics for cancer. He graduated from uh, Sheffield University with a degree in zoology and then a PhD at the Imperial Cancer Research Fund in London. Then he did postdoctoral fellowships and for 24 years was a professor at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. He then um, moved back to Edinburgh where he um, led these research programs. So he was a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh, the, a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences. He received the American Cancer Society Medal of Honor for basic science research and numerous other awards. So Jeff uh, was a pioneer discovering the um, role of MCSF and macrophages in biology and cancer, and uh, he is sorely missed. So as you proceed with your research, remember Jeff, and uh, <clears throat> we will dedicate the Myeloid Network future seminars to Jeff's memory. <clears throat> So I want to tell you briefly about a meeting that we're having uh, in advance of the SITSI annual meeting this uh, November. So please join us for our pre-conference program, an entire day on of talks on myeloid cells in cancer. Uh, and um, you will uh, please uh, sign up for this pre-meeting as well as the SITSI meeting in beautiful San Diego, California. So thank you. And then today I'm really pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael Kliczynski, uh, who is co-founder and chief scientific officer of Charisma Therapeutics, a very novel and innovative company that is genetically engineering macrophages for cancer therapy. So his talk is Cancer Engineering Macrophages, CAR M and Beyond. And again, we're very grateful for the support of Charisma Therapeutics of the Myeloid Network. So now I'd like to um, uh, just briefly mention about uh, Dr. Kaczynski's background. He's the co-inventor of the CAR macrophage technology and the scientific co-founder of Charisma Therapeutics. He is overseeing research and discovery efforts as chief scientific officer. He uh, developed these CAR macrophages during his doctoral thesis under the mentorship of Sar Gill and Carl June at the University of Pennsylvania. His expertise is in immunology, synthetic biology, cancer immune therapy, and translational pharmacology. So um, we're so happy to have you today and look forward to your talk. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Judith. Thanks everyone for joining. Let me pull up the slides here. Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'll be walking you through a story today around a technology that we started working on almost 10 years ago now back at, at Penn. 
uh, when Sargil and I asked the question, what would happen if we put a car into macrophages? Can we redirect these potent innate immune cells against tumor associated antigens and drive anti tumor immunity? And it's been quite a fun ride. Um, and I, I'll walk you through some of the rationale for developing car macrophages, some of the techniques in actually making these cells, um, a, a sampling of preclinical data that, that validates this uh, technology in the cancer immunotherapy space. And then I'll walk you through our early clinical data with our phase one study with an anti HER2 car macrophage CTO508. This is the first genetically engineered macrophage uh, to be given to a human being, certainly the first car macrophage. And uh, we're excited about the early data that we're seeing. And then I'll talk about a new story where we engineer macrophages with another type of synthetic receptor that's not a chimeric antigen receptor. Uh, and we think it has broad applicability in, in oncology and in chronic inflammatory uh, disease. Um, we are a publicly traded company. These are my cautionary notes regarding forward-looking statements. Anything I say is subject to the risks that are delineated in our regulatory filings with the SEC. Now, CAR T-cells have been a transformational novel approach in the treatment of, of cancer. CAR T-cells have are a living drug where T-cells are taken out of the body, genetically modified with a CAR, which combines an extracellular antigen recognition domain with intracellular activating domains that drive immune effector function. The cells are typically made from a patient's own T cells, though there are many allogeneic approaches. And there are now a number of approved therapies, including Kimraya, Yescarta, Becma, Carvicti, um, and others for the treatment of, of blood cancers. And these are truly revolutionary uh, therapeutics that are leading to complete responses in patients who otherwise uh, have exhausted all options. Um, and, and are heavily pretreated and previously had no, had no therapeutic modalities that could potentially help. Uh, unfortunately, the responses in solid tumors, whether it's breast cancer, liver cancer, pancreatic cancer, et cetera, the response rates have not translated. In the blood cancer setting, where we're going after antigens such as CD19 or BCMA, CD19, for example, in the early studies at Penn back in 2014, um, a 70 plus percent response rate was seen in, in, in acute leukemia. Um, if we plot the complete response rates going from liquid tumors from CD19, BCMA, moving to, to a number of different solid tumor antigens, the trend is quite clear. We're going from high response rates to almost no uh, response rates. And this has been uh, the case regardless of the target antigen, regardless of the design of the CAR, the co-stimulatory domain, the characteristics of the binder, the route of administration, the treatment regimen, the dose, patient population, et cetera, the responses simply do not, do not translate in, in a direct way. And there's a tremendous amount of effort in academia and industry to overcome this problem um, in different ways, to make a better T-cell, use other immune cells, make a better CAR, look at different uh, gene editing approaches and so on. And th there are many minds at work on, on this exact issue. And while we actually don't know exactly why CAR T-cell efficacy fails to translate from the blood cancer setting to the solid tumor setting, I think there are three general areas that we would all agree are in play. The first is trafficking. As solid tumors develop, they, they must employ a variety of mechanisms to keep T-cells out. Uh, tumors go out of their way to minimize T-cell uh, infiltration, whether it's through a dense extracellular matrix or, or using macrophages, for example, uh, to line uh, the outside edges of the tumor to keep T-cells from infiltrating, down-regulating chemokines that recruit T-cells, and, and so on. Um, there is an inherent homing extravasation um, issue and being able to generate a sufficient number of cells in the tumor uh, to mount uh, a meaningful anti-tumor response is, is a known um, challenge. So trafficking. If the cells are able to traffic into the tumor and penetrate the TME in a sufficient number, they're of course faced with a, a variety of flavors of, of immunosuppression within the tumor microenvironment, whether it comes from immune ligands such as pdl one whether it comes from immunosuppressive cytokines such as IL-10 and TGF-beta, um, whether it comes from an unfavorable met um, metabolic environment that limits T cell proliferation, a lack of antigen presentation, a downregulation of MHC, uh, a low inflammatory score. Um, all of these um, um, forces are in play to, to limit uh, T cell activation and function. Now, if you are able to overcome trafficking, you are able to overcome the TME, going after a single antigen or even two antigens is a challenge in the solid tumor environment. CD19 is a beautiful target because it's expressed on all B cells, but even still, uh, CD19 negative relapse is a known uh, challenge in 
uh, I believe approximately 20% of patients relapse with CD19 negative leukemia after CART19 treatment. In solid tumors, the risk is far higher. Solid tumors are far more heterogeneous. Uh, safe antigens are difficult to identify that are um, solely expressed on tumor cells and not normal tissue. Um, antigen heterogeneity within a single mass is high. Antigen heterogeneity throughout the course of disease is high and between the primary lesion and metastatic lesions, um, having robust expression of the target antigen is, is a challenge. Um, and being able to mount epitope spreading and mount a broad adaptive immune response that enables immunity beyond the initial antigen that the car happens to target is, I believe, a necessary component for, for meaningful efficacy in, in the solid tumor setting. Now, as everyone here knows, and I, I won't go through much of a macrophage introduction given, given who everyone here is, macrophage enthusiasts, uh, macrophages actively infiltrate solid tumors. And there's, there's decades of data showing that, generally speaking, um, having an increased macrophage infiltration score is associated with poor prognostic outcomes. For example, in breast cancer, um, studies have shown that as CD68 positive immunohistochemistry scores go up, patients have a naturally, um, naturally worse progression and, and, and die faster from, from metastatic uh, breast cancer. And it has been known for, for decades by pathologists that macrophages are the most abundant immune cell infiltrating the solid tumor microenvironment. And of course, macrophages go out of their way to recruit macrophages. Tumors go out of their way to recruit macrophages, unlike lymphocytes, which they generally go out of their way to ex exclude. And tumors do this because macrophages are, are highly, highly plastic cells that are able to take on a variety of phenotypic states and exert a variety of um, diverse effector functions, some of which may help the tumor in, in aiding its overall, overall mission of, of cell division and, and growth and immunosuppression, angiogenesis, metastasis, um, et cetera. But of course, we all know that macrophages are also potent innate immune effector cells. Outside of the tumor microenvironment, macrophages are first responders. Um, these are the most phagocytic cells in the immune system and in, 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 in the body. Macrophages have variety of mechanisms for phagocytosis, including through FC receptors, via, mono, via antibodies. Macrophages are able to kill through other means beyond phagocytosis. They are able to induce apoptosis of tumor cells. Um, they, generally, they can't lyse tumor cells, uh, but they can kill in multiple ways. And of course, they can, they can mount um, inflammation. They can recruit T cells and NK cells through the production of inflammatory chemokines. They can activate T cells, NK cells, dendritic cells themselves and surrounding macrophages or other myeloid cells through the production of inflammatory cytokines. And importantly, um, macrophages are professional antigen presenting cells. They can present and they can cross present and they can co-stimulate a meaningful T cell response. So macrophages offer a unique opportunity when it comes to cell therapy. It's the cell type that tumors like. Um, it's a cell type that has a unique mechanism of action and has the potential to overcome all of those challenges that I walk through trafficking, if properly controlled, properly polarized, um, and, and engineered macrophages can, can be skewed toward an, um, a favorable phenotype and a favorable set of, of functions. Um, and macrophages are, um, able to present antigen and, and mount, uh, a T cell response. I think someone drew on the slide. I don't know if everyone can see that, but um, please don't. The, uh, there have been early attempts for macrophage cell therapy um, without genetic engineering in the 90s and, and early 2000s, primarily led by uh, a pioneer in the space named Reinhard Andriessen um, in Germany. And in these early studies, macrophages and monocyte derived macrophages were administered to patients. Um, and the hypothesis was macrophages have all these potential functions. Macrophages can indeed um, uh, phagocytose. And um, you know, if you co-culture them with tumor cells in vitro, there's some baseline anti-tumor effect, especially if they're activated toward an M1 phenotype. Um, and studies were done to transfer interferon gamma and LPS activated M1 macrophages into patients. Trafficking was demonstrated in some patients. Safety was demonstrated. There was no meaningful uh, clinical efficacy. And in speaking to Reinhardt, the, the, the two limiting factors are number one, that the macrophage's natural armamentarium was too weak. They weren't armed with a tool to recognize and engage uh, cancer cells. 
And number two, their phenotype was not locked and they were subject to the whims of the tumor and can be subverted back um, or subverted toward an immunosuppressive M2 phenotype where their functionality um, thus may be, may be lost. So what we have developed at, at Charisma um, is a novel approach um, that we, we termed CAR-M long ago, CAR macrophages. And the way that this works is we take monocytes from patient's blood, we differentiate them into macrophages, we engineer them to express a CAR. We showed that a CAR is able to drive phagocytosis. Um, so you're introducing a single gene and you can tell these cells what to eat and what to kill. Um, at the same time, we use an inflammatory vector that polarizes and locks these cells into an inflammatory phenotype. And in the process of phagocytosis, these CAR macrophages are releasing uh, inflammatory cytokines and chemokines, immediately augmenting the tumor microenvironment, and ultimately um, processing and presenting the antigens that they derived through CAR-mediated phagocytosis and mounting an anti-tumor T-cell response that, of course, goes beyond the antigen that your CAR uh, targets. Um, again, please, uh, no shape making. Um, um, let, me, let me just uh, say, um, <clears throat> uh, whoever is drawing, please don't draw on the Zoom while we're um, underway, please. Thank you. Thank you. Now, a notable challenge in the field um, is, is the ability uh, to engineer primary human monocytes and macrophages. As I'm sure all of you know that work with these cells, they're tricky cells to, to handle, they're tricky cells to keep happy and viable. And once you start trying to express genes, um, macrophages uh, tend to have, to have um, unfavorable responses. They can die, they can become overactivated, et cetera. So identifying a means of efficient gene expression, durable gene expression with high viability is, has been a meaningful challenge. For example, Simply electroporating or transfecting DNA plasmids does not work. Very low efficiency, low viability, poor persistence. Um, Adeno-associated viruses are not efficient. Traditional lentivirus, very low efficiency. Um, some of the traditional adenoviral vectors like AD5 have generally low or moderate gene expression efficiency. mRNA, of course, can work. You can electroporate mRNA into anything, um, and you can get a high level of expression of your gene. Um, the viability is variable depending on, on what you're introducing, uh, but the persistence is very low. mRNA is inherently transient. So if you electroporate or, or life effect mRNA into, into macrophages or monocytes, you'll only get a day or a couple of days of expression of, of your gene. And of course, when it comes to CARs, we think that that persistence is important. So what we identified um, back at Penn in, in, um, in the Center for Cellular Immunotherapies was a vector um, called at 5 f 35 that, that was previously developed at the University of Washington. Um, and this vector is a chimera where the ad 35 uh, knob is, is engineered onto the ad 5 uh, backbone, and that changes the tropism from the Coxsackie adenovirus receptor, which monocytes and macrophages don't express, to CD46, which monocytes and macrophages um, highly express to complement a pathway-associated receptor. Uh, and this vector enabled us to engineer human macrophages with high efficiency. We cloned the car into this into this vector um, and and showed that we can make um, macrophages expressing any gene with ninety percent plus uh, efficiency. And we've since um, really optimized this process at the company. There's only one other uh, viral vector that's known to be effective in macrophage um, engineering, and that's the VPX lentivirus, um, developed by our collaborator Ned Landau uh, at at NYU. Um, and this, this vector is unique. It's a lentivirus that carries VPX as a protein in its, in its tegument, and it releases VPX as soon as the, the virus enters the cell. VPX binds to SAMHD1, um, which keeps um, at the level of nucleotides and macrophages at a very low level. Once SAMHD1 is, is um, degraded in a ubiquitin-mediated pathway by VPX, uh, the nucleotide levels rise and reverse transcription is now able to be effective. So with a standard lenti, you can maybe get 10% expression. With a VPX lenti, we can get close to 100% expression of our gene of interest. And Charisma holds a license to this vector for, for all use uh, from, from uh, NYU. Now, these two vectors are different in one, key, uh, in one key parameter. When you use an adenovirus, you trigger a variety of um, activating receptors in the macrophage, and you, by definition, will always get a highly M1 macrophage, which is great for oncology applications. 
Not so great for non-oncology applications, which is where VPX lentivirus comes in. It has no phenotypic impact on the cell. You just express your genes. The cells are still M0 or neutral, and you can control the phenotype to your, to your state of choice. Um, at Charisma, um, we've spent years developing this platform and converting it to a full-scale GMP environment so that we can actually manufacture large numbers, billions of autologous or allogeneic macrophages and monocytes. We are developing both at Charisma. We currently have a process for both macrophages and for monocytes. The macrophage process takes a week. The monocyte process takes a day. And these proprietary platforms enable us to engineer monocytes and macrophages with high efficiency. And while our initial focus is, is CAR, and we're pioneering the CAR M, CAR macrophage, and CAR monocyte space, there's um, there, there are other approaches that we're investigating that go beyond oncology as well and go beyond autologous, both through allogeneic iPSC-derived myeloid cells. And more recently, um, we're developing direct in vivo reprogramming of myeloid cells using uh, myeloid tropic lipid nanoparticles through a large collaboration with, with Moderna. So um, onto the preclinical data. Um, what do human CAR macrophages actually do? So when the CAR binds to its target, in this case, HER2 is a model antigen, um, the macrophages release large amounts of inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha here shown as an example. When we delete the intracellular signaling domain, in this case, CD3 zeta, um, the function of the macrophage in terms of cytokine release is gone. CAR macrophages are able to phagocytose, target overexpressing, in this case, again, HER2, but not target negative um, tumor cells. And this is simply through a CAR. There's no additional opsonization. We're not adding any antibodies. We're not blocking CD47, though it is highly expressed on these target cells. We're not blocking SERP alpha. We're not adding complement. It's one gene, one CAR, and you get robust phagocytosis. Together, these effects of, of phagocytosis, cytokine release, and other killing mechanisms lead to a potent killer cell. Um, if we co-culture CAR macrophages with, um, in this case, a HER2 expressing target cell, the CAR, but not the untransduced control macrophages, clear the tumor cells rapidly in vitro. And interestingly, despite the fact that these macrophages do not proliferate, since macrophages generally don't expand, um, they are able to serial kill. So we ran a study where every couple days we added more tumor cells to the same culture of CAR macrophages. And every time we spiked in more cancer cells, they killed, they killed again, and they killed again. So like CAR T cells, CAR macrophages are indeed uh, serial killers. But importantly, the CAR has to be maintained for this, for this to happen. So to see what this actually looks like, here's a video of CAR macrophages uh, in red, cultured with um, antigen-positive tumor cells in green. They find the cells, they phagocytose, and you can see the same hungry cells can, can eat multiple targets uh, at once. Our record holder, CAR macrophage, phagocytose, I believe 18 uh, tumor cells. Now, in addition to phagocytosis and cytokine release, we asked the question, are there gene expression changes that occur once the CAR signals in the macrophage? Uh, so to answer that question, we, we took um, CAR macrophages against HER2, and we either left, left them unstimulated, stimulated them with mesothelin, which is an irrelevant antigen, or with HER2, the target antigen, and we ran the cells through um, single cell RNA sequencing. We evaluated the clusters with and without stimulation and found that um, there, is, there are a number of populations at baseline um, based on gene expression. Whether you unstimulate or stimulate with a control protein mesothelin, those populations don't change. But once you, they see the antigen, HER2, you can see that almost all the cells fall into this, um, this yellow cluster, number one. And when we look at the gene expression pathway analysis, we can see that a variety of inflammatory gene expression pathways are being turned on upon antigen engagement. So the CAR macrophages are self-polarizing toward an M1 uh, phenotype upon antigen engagement. We evaluated CAR macrophage anti-tumor function in preclinical xenograft models um, th that we published in Nature Biotechnology some time ago. These are humanized models where we can see that CAR macrophage monotherapy improved tumor control. Uh, and importantly, we looked at the impact on the humanized tumor microenvironment and found that treatment with CAR but not control macrophages activated the surrounding uh, myeloid, humanized, human myeloid compartment in these, in these models. We also found that CAR macrophages in vitro are able to directly recruit T cells, both CD4s and CD8s resting and activated um, 
it, through the chemokines that they're producing. Uh, this is in a trans wall assay. And in an antigen cross-presentation assay, we found that CAR macrophages have a much higher ability to prime, to cross-present and co-stimulate antigens to, um, to, to human T cells compared to control macrophages. Now, to really put this to the test in a meaningful model, humanized models have a number of limitations, as, as many of you probably have experienced. Um, we sought to develop fully mirroring syngenetic models so that we can look at the impact of a suppressive TME on these macrophages, the impact of our macrophages on the suppressive TME, and most importantly, our ability to drive epitope spreading and mount a T cell response against, against tumors. Can we lead to, can we really see epitope spreading? Um, to enable this, we had to establish a primary murine uh, macrophage system. We are able to use the same vector at 5F35 to make murine car macrophages robustly, um, and they have the same uh, M1 phenotype upon seeing the adenoviral vector. We put these to the test in a number of models. Here I'm showing CT26 um, that we engineered to overexpress HER2. Um, this is a HER2 3 plus colon cancer model. Car macrophage monotherapy led to improved tumor control, led to improved overall survival. And when we looked at the tumor microenvironment, um, and looked at T cells in this uh, CD8 T cells by IHC, you can see that treatment with CAR macrophages led to a robust recruitment of CD8 T cells into, into the TME. And by flow cytometry, we confirmed the same thing. Um, CD8 T cells increased, CD4 T cells increased. And importantly, we don't simply want to increase T cell numbers. We want T cells that are tumor reactive. And we, by looking for interferon gamma positive tumor infiltrating CD8 lymphocytes, we could see that the fraction of activated TILs went up on treatment. And when we look for specific um, uh, CT26 reactive T cells that bind to a known class one antigen called GP70, this data is not shown here, but we saw a significant increase in, in GP70 uh, TCR uh, tumor positive T cells. Now to functionally evaluate epitope spreading, we, we looked for, we, we ran two studies. Um, that were, were designed by um, a great scientist at Charisma named Stefano Pierini. And what we did here was we, we ran a dual flank model where the, we grew two CT26 tumors, one of which expresses HER2, the other one is wild type, otherwise congenic. And we treated the HER2 positive tumor with our CAR macrophages, and we measured the growth of both. Um, and of course, the HER2 positive tumor melted as expected um, in the course of approximately three weeks, shown here on the bottom left. Uh, but interestingly, when we treated, uh, when we measured the wild-type tumor, we found that there was an inhibition of the growth rate of the wild-type tumor, which the CAR macrophages themselves, of course, cannot see, telling us that we're mounting an adaptive immune response, and we could see an increase in T-cells and T-cell activation in the contralateral uh, flank, telling us that an episcopal effect was indeed, um, was indeed mediated. Now, this is, that was somewhat of an artificial model. Patients don't come in with two tumors on opposite sides without a complete opposite antigen expression profiles. Uh, but what does happen in the clinic is antigen negative relapse following the selective pressure of the CAR. So to mimic antigen negative relapse, we grew her two positive tumors in BALP-C mice. We treated with CAR macrophages. We then took the complete responders, held them for two months post-tumor rejection, and we then re-challenged them with a wild type HER2 negative version of the tumor. As a control, we engrafted the same inoculum of the wild type HER2 negative CT26 in naive age and sex matched mice. And we monitored tumor growth and survival. And what, you, what we found was that all of the mice that were previous CAR-M responders were completely protected from rechallenge, were alive, tumor free, while all of the naive mice grew tumors and died in approximately a month. Um, not shown here, but we, we demonstrated that this was in fact mediated by a memory T cell response. If we deplete T cells, the protection was lost in these same exact mice. So this is direct evidence of not only immune memory, but epitope spreading since we removed the primary antigen of the car. Now, as I described, we're now in the clinic with, with CTO508. This is a HER2 targeted car macrophage. This was the first genetically engineered macrophage, first car macrophage to go into the clinic. CTO508 is an autologous monocyte derived macrophage engineered with AD5F35 to express a HER2 CAR. The phase one study is now ongoing at, at uh, seven uh, sites across the country. We've presented early clinical data, and I'll go through some of those key findings here uh, today. Um, we've seen that CAR macrophages are safe. They are feasible to manufacture from heavily pretreated solid tumor patients. 
and the translational data that we've seen provide a clinical validation of the CAR macrophage mechanism of action. We now have two sub-studies that are, that are open. One is an intraperitoneal study for patients with uh, primary peritoneal uh, cancers or, or metastases, uh, and a combination study with CTO508 and the immune checkpoint inhibitor Keytruda or pembrolizumab. To walk you through the process, the manufacturing process, um, patients are first um, mobilized with GCSF, which increases their peripheral blood monocyte count and enables us to generate a larger num uh, cell dose. Patients then sit for apheresis, a LUCA pack is collected, shipped to our manufacturing site, monocytes are isolated with CD14 selection, differentiated into macrophages, transduced with the AD5F35 vector, which delivers the CAR and polarizes to M1, cells are then cryopreserved, sent back to, to the clinic, uh, where they're thawed at the bedside and infused back into the patient without any lymphodepletion, no chemotherapy conditioning, um, which is used for, I believe, all other um, cell therapies today. We work with um, um, uh, two manufacturing partners, Molteni, and more recently, we entered into a partnership with Novartis, and Novartis is manufacturing CTO 508 out of their uh, commercial manufacturing site in New Jersey, where Kim Raya uh, is produced for the U.S. So see, the phase one study is a multi-center open-label single-arm phase one study in patients with HER2 2 plus or 3 plus advanced solid tumors. This is a basket trial, meaning we're not limiting it to breast cancer, for example. Any, um, any histology is welcome as long as they meet the um, other inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I'll be sharing data from group one, which is an intrapatient dose escalation of up to 5 billion cells split over three infusions in one week. Group two is actively enrolling. Um, and all the translational data that I'll go through today was um, all the translational studies were led by um, a, a great scientist and our uh, vice president of, of research here at Charisma, Toma Kondamin. So first, a key question for us going into the study is, can we actually make high quality CAR macrophages from very advanced patients, patients that enter phase one cell therapy trials, as, as you can imagine, are, are generally quite sick. These are patients that have exhausted all other options uh, and have advanced disease and heavily pretreated. Um, and a notable concern was, do these patients that have a history of chemotherapy, radiation, targeted therapy, et cetera, are we able to make quality myeloid cells from their peripheral myeloid compartment, which may have been damaged by prior treatments? Um, we did not see any, any issue in group one of the study. We we're able to make CAR macrophages in the same quality and quantity as in, with, with healthy donors. Um, we see that our patient-derived CTO508 in blue have a high viability, have a high purity, and have a very high car, car expression, averaging at over 80%. Um, we evaluate each patient's CAR macrophages in vitro in functional assays. Um, this here is a killing assay where we co-culture CAR macrophages with um, HER2-positive breast cancer cells in vitro and look at their uh, killing function. While there is some patient-to-patient -patient variability, all batches can kill with a similar level to healthy donors in orange, and all patient CAR macrophages can phagocytose with a similar level to, to healthy donors. We evaluated the phenotype of these cells um, here using uh, single-cell RNA sequencing, um, and we applied a, a known M1, M2 signature uh, based on uh, the expression level of approximately 30 uh, inflammatory macrophage genes, 30 or so suppressive macrophage genes, um, and map them onto each patient's either baseline monocytes in gray or final CTO508 in blue. And you can see that for each patient in each box, the cells were indeed M1 polarized um, as compared to the baseline product. We also evaluated the ability of, for cytokine and chemokine release for each patient cell. So again, each data point here is a unique patient, stimulated with either mesothelin, which is a um, control or with HER2, which is the target. And you can see that while there is some variability, all patients were able to produce uh, TNF-alpha, other cytokines, and other chemokines uh, in response to the target antigen. So we are able to make high quality functional cells from, from these patients. Safety was the primary uh, goal of this phase one study. As I mentioned, this is untapped territory. There's um, an ample um, uh, literature for CAR T and now CAR NK, uh, safety, um, pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, and, and efficacy in a variety of indications. 
this is new. So the, the primary goal is to understand if CAR macrophages are safe. And HER2 is, is a great target, but it is expressed to some low extent on normal tissue. Um, so there is, there is some, some risk involved. And we believe that if we see that CAR macrophages against HER2 are well tolerated, then that likely is going to translate to, to most other um, uh, antigens. The majority of adverse events were mild grade one or grade two. Um, we saw an infusion reaction um, in three out of nine patients, grade one, and one out of nine patients, grade two. And top of mind with CAR with, with any CAR cell therapy is cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity. We did not have any cases of severe grade three or grade four CRS. We had four cases of grade one CRS and two cases of grade two CRS, all of which were well tolerated. Uh, and we did not have any cases of, of neurotoxicity. Overall, O5 late has been well tolerated. We have not reached any dose limiting toxicities. The majority of AEs were, were, were um, grade one or two. And we don't see any evidence of on target off tumor toxicity, which with HER2 would manifest as cardiopulmonary toxicity. We evaluated the cytokine, um, serum cytokine levels and fever in patients after each dose. And you can see that on the top, after each infusion, and, and shown here in the dotted line, there was a transient spike in, in, in low-grade fever, and there was a transient and low-grade elevation in IL-6 and a number of other inflammatory cytokines. But in all cases, they were self-limiting. For severe CRS to occur, not only does the level need to be higher, but the, the curved shape needs to show a sustained elevation that kicks off a positive feedback loop and leads to severe CRS. Here, we're seeing um, a transient cytokine elevations in the blood. We looked at the PK of the cells in the blood. Um, they spiked immediately post-infusion and were no longer detectable in the blood by approximately eight hours. Um, this is expected. Macrophages leave the blood. They will not recirculate like lymphocytes. They will leave the blood. They'll go to the tissue. They'll go to the tumor, um, but you won't find them in the blood for long. Um, and that is one of the reasons why we don't think severe CRS is, is, is likely to happen. Um, we were able to detect CTO 508 in the TME of eight out of nine patients in, in group one. So we are seeing evidence of the cells getting to the tumor. Now moving to the translational data, um, we looked at the TME quite closely with a number of techniques, asking the questions, are the CAR macrophages able to activate the TME in the clinic? Are they able to drive macrophage activation? Are they able to recruit and activate T cells and lead to epitope spreading? We first, looking, looking here on this slide at the myeloid compartment, we found an increased fraction of M1 macrophages. Um, we found an upregulation of M1-associated genes in the intratumoral myeloid cells. Um, for example, the way to interpret this plot in B, and this is from a single um, exemplary patient with esophageal cancer. Using single-cell RNA-seq, we zoom in on the myeloid cells within the TME. At screening, we see that this patient has very low levels of expression of a variety of inflammatory genes like TNF-alpha and IL-6, IL-1-beta, IL-1-alpha, and others. Week four post CTO-508 monotherapy, we can see that these genes are, are turning on within the TME. Similarly, we looked specifically at the ant antigen presentation machinery in the TME, um, comparing expression at week four versus at, at baseline. And you can see that class one related genes and class two related genes increased over time for the majority of patients. Now, moving to T cells, as I, as I mentioned in the beginning, macrophages are killer cells, but macrophages, in my mind, um, are antigen presenting cells, and we need them to recruit and prime T cells. Um, and, and to me, that's what, what can drive meaningful, meaningful responses. Um, we measured the fraction of T cells within the TME at screening and at week four. Um, here, I'm showing three example patients with single cell RNA sequencing, looking at the fraction of effector T cells out of all immune cells. Um, you can see that the effector T cell fraction is increasing with treatment. For example, in patient two, um, the at baseline, only 5% of the immune cells within the TME uh, were effector T cells four weeks after CAR macrophage treatment. Though that went up fivefold to 25% of all immune cells. We also looked at the T cell activation levels um, within the TME over time at screening and at day eight and at week four. These are three separate biopsies. And you can see that over time, as you go from top to bottom, um, and as time passes with treatment, you can see that T cells are becoming more, more activated through a, a lot of different um, pathways. And chemokines are going up, co-stimulatory molecules, cytokines and effector molecules, 
transcription factors, and importantly, inhibitory receptors, not surprisingly, are also going up as when you activate T cells. Immediately, of course, they upregulate compensatory mechanisms to prevent overactivation. So PD-1 and others are indeed being upregulated. And this is um, part of the rationale why we are now um, uh, have opened a combination study with pembrolizumab. Now, to evaluate the specifics of the T cell response um, and to ask the question um, about epitope spreading, we evaluated um, the T cell repertoire through T cell receptor sequencing. Every T cell has a unique TCR. You can, you can sequence those unique junctions and understand um, uh, changes to the repertoire. Um, we found that there was expansion of T cells in the peripheral blood of all patients treated. When we looked at the T cells that are expanding in the peripheral blood and we mapped them to the T cell repertoire in the TME, we found that there is an accumulation of exp peripherally expanding clones in the TME over time. And when we specifically look for emergent clones, which are T cells that were previously not identified that are emerging on treatment, um, we see that there is a stark increase in emerging clones that are peripherally expanding, accumulating in the tumor over time. Now, they would be unlikely to accumulate in the TME if they weren't reactive against tumor-associated antigens. So we took it a step further and looked at the most expanding T cell clones that were newly emergent, and we mapped their PCR against the single cell RNA-seq data to find their phenotype and activation state. And we found that the newly emergent accumulating, that newly emergent clones accumulating in the TME took on an activated cytotoxic CD8 phenotype, um, expressing genes like granzyme B, interferon GANA, per perforin, KI67, um, telling us that they are indeed um, becoming activated within the tumor. Um, taken together, I think the, these data are compelling to suggest that we are driving anti-tumor um, uh, adaptive uh, immunity. So in summary, we've shown so far that uh, this is feasible, this is safe. Um, the best overall response thus far in this, in this uh, uh, cohort has been stable disease, which we've seen in four out of nine patients. Um, group two is now enrolling along with sub-studies um, for uh, Pembro uh, combo. Now, speaking of Pembro uh, combination with T-cell checkpoint inhibitors, um, immune checkpoint inhibition has been um, an, an absolute uh, game changer in the treatment of, of, of cancer. Um, and I, I believe something like 70% of patients with solid tumors see a checkpoint inhibitor at some point in their treatment course. However, the majority of patients do not respond. Um, and only something like 20% of patients across different indications have, have a response. And that number is far lower in some indications, like breast cancer, where, where immune checkpoint inhibitors are not even indicated. Um, when we look at reasons why patients respond or don't respond, and there's an, a, an enormous body of literature around this, this question, um, there is a, a clear pattern that stands out. The majority of patients that have a response to PD-1 blockade have a high tumor mutational burden, they have more mutations to, to go after, uh, to, for the T cells to see, and they have a high T cell inflamed gene expression profile, the tumors are warmer, so to speak, and the TMEs are more permissive. Patients with a low tumor mutation burden, low um, gene expression, uh, uh, T cell inflamed gene expression profile have no responses. Um, and patients that have a high TMB but low gene expression profile also have poor responses. So there's nothing that we can do to increase the tumor mutational burden, of course, uh, but can we use engineered myeloid cells and CAR-M to drive the increase of the T-cell inflamed gene expression profile and convert these patients on the left-hand side of the graph from non-responders to responders? And we've, we've worked on this preclinically extensively um, in, in a variety of models, and we've shown that the combination of CAR macrophages with blockade of PD-1 is highly synergistic. These are antigen-presenting cells. They react interact with T-cells, but there's nothing inherent about a CAR macrophage's effector function that can disexhaust the T cell. They'll recruit, they'll prime, they'll, they'll co-stimulate, but if the cell's exhausted, it's exhausted. Uh, and we, we believe we need a checkpoint inhibitor on board to overcome that, that limitation. In mouth models, there's improved tumor control, and importantly, there's improved um, TME modulation when the two are combined. If you look on the right-hand side, this is ion path multi- um, um, a multi-parameter uh, immunofluorescence analysis. In a control untreated tumor, uh, this is CT26, the majority of the cells are blue, which are tumor cells or fibroblasts. When we give PD-1 alone, you see macrophages coming in in green. When we give CAR macrophages, you see macrophages in green plus T cells in yellow. 
when you combine the two, first thing you see is way less blue, which means the tumor is melting. And you see other colors coming in. The red are dendritic cells. Purple are other myeloid cells. The T cells are, are uh, infiltrating deeper into the tumor. Um, and when we quantify this not shown here, we see a far greater rate of tumor reactive and activated TILs uh, when the two are combined. We took this a step further and evaluated a model that we have that we know does not respond to CAR macrophage monotherapy and does not respond to PD-1 monotherapy. And when the two were combined, you can see that the results were quite, quite um, clear. Um, the tumors were completely rejected, in, both in terms of the tumor growth curve and in terms of survival. So we now have a, a study that's open at multiple sites that's enrolling uh, patients with HER2 overexpressing solid tumors um, in combination with, uh, with pembrolizumab. This is a safety trial um, in a population that generally does not respond to monotherapy with immune, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors. So in the last 15 minutes uh, or so, where do we go from here? So Charisma has been hard at work developing a variety of enhancements to the platform, both in terms of the cell and in terms of the gene engineering strategies that we use. Can we make better cars? Can we incorporate additional signaling domains? Can we delete genes that are inhibitory to the macrophage, such as SERP alpha, the do not eat me receptor, uh, to improve, to improve car, car function? Um, we've made next gen cars that we see have improved um, effector function. We've developed means to gene edit car macrophages um, to remove inhibitory pathways such as SERP alpha, um, which we've shown improves car macrophage function. Um, one I'd like to highlight is a, a change to the cell manufacturing process. Rather than differentiating our monocytes into macrophages, we asked the question can we directly engineer them in the monocyte stage? identify a way to ensure that they will finish differentiating into M1 macrophages within the patient, uh, but the actual product is a monocyte. Um, and we've developed this process. Um, this is our next program, CTO525, with the IND going in uh, this year. Um, CTO525 is an anti-HER2 car monocyte. It's made using the same ad 5 f 35 vector, and we see that these cells are able to uh, persist uh, for a long time, they express CAR for months. They can uh, persist in uh, in vivo uh, for at least 250 days. This is um, these are monocytes expressing CAR and luciferase, and we track their luciferase score. Um, there's there's a peak, uh, but they're present in the mouse for over 250 days. And importantly, we saw this even in NSG mice where there is no cytokine support. We evaluated these CAR monocytes in a humanized orthotopic pancreatic cancer model where we implant a pancreatic cancer um, surgically into the mouse pancreas, allow it to grow, and then treat with IV CAR monocyte monotherapy. Uh, and you can see that CAR monocytes led to um, an improved um, uh, tumor control rate. Now, in addition to um, this development with monocytes, which in addition to the biological parameters, also allow us to make more cells. Um, we, we know that with this monocyte process, we can make approximately five-fold more cells than with the macrophage process. Um, our next program, Beyond HER2, is a CAR-M targeting mesothelin, CT1119, um, led by um, a great scientist named Nick Anderson. We've shown that um, we, we've made an SCFE that is fully human with a human binder, um, targeting a non-shed portion of the mesothelin antigen, which is expressed in a variety of solid tumors, such as uh, ovarian, pancreatic, um, lung cancer, mesothelioma, and, and a number of others. These anti-mesothelin CAR macrophages are able to phagocytose and release cytokines in response to mesothelin overexpressing uh, tumor cells. And they can do this in a stable fashion, even either acutely or weeks after the cells are, are transduced. And we evaluated this these in a uh, simple xenograft model, non-humanized, where the only effector function can come from the macrophages themselves. So it's, it's a limiting, right? Since we're only looking at phagocytosis and no T cell priming. Uh, and we can see that treatment with CT1119 and an aggressive metastatic lung cancer model led to a reduction in the number of metastases um, in, in the lungs of, of mice. Now, everything I've discussed so far is around cell therapy taking monocytes out of blood, engineering them, and using them as a living drug. Um, we entered into a partnership with Moderna at the start of last year um, with an entirely new paradigm uh, in mind. Rather than taking cells from patients and engineering them, can we find the cells we want and engineer them directly within the body? Going from a living drug 
to what I would consider a more traditional drug and certainly an off the shelf allogeneic, uh, not, not allogeneic, but off the shelf drug that is still autologous in the sense that you are engineering a patient's own cell. So you have full MHC matching and a full potential to mount um, a T cell response since without matching MHCs, you can't present antigens. Um, Together with Moderna, we're using a myeloid tropic lipid nanoparticle that finds myeloid cells within the body and within the tumor and delivers an mRNA encoding the CAR. We've shown um, that um, in a, an organoid model where we mix breast cancer cells together with tumor-associated macrophages that are already polarized toward a, a, an M2 TAM phenotype, we drop the lipid nanoparticles on top of these co-cultures. We immediately convert these TAMs to CAR-M, and you can see that over time, these, these uh, organoids uh, uh, shrink. We're working with Moderna to develop this for, for a number of, of, of targets uh, in, in oncology, uh, and we're very excited about this uh, transformational approach. Um, I'll skip our pipeline for the sake of time and go into a, a, a new story that we haven't presented before. Um, um, but we, we have presented some of this data um, in a poster, um, developed by a brilliant scientist at Charisma named Chris Slos. And this approach um, rethinks the way we, we look at macrophage targeting. Um, cytokines are a culprit in a variety of diseases, and cytokine balance is critical to maintain tissue homeostasis. And in oncology, in the solid tumor microenvironment, there is most frequently, um, an abundance of immunosuppressive cytokines, such as IL-10 or TGF-beta, um, that overwhelm the inflammatory cytokines. On the contrary, in inflammatory, chronic inflammatory disease, autoimmune disease, such as NASH, IBD, CKD, um, the opposite is true. There is an abundance of inflammatory cytokines, such as interferon, gamma, and others, TNF-alpha, IL-17, IL-23, IL-6, and so on. Macrophages are not only able to produce these cytokines, but are able to respond to them. And macrophages are the immune cell that is present in every tissue throughout the body that, in, that serves as the processor that receives these signals and responds with an output. Macrophages are cytokine processors. Now, we asked the question, can we use genetic engineering to program macrophages to rethink how they interpret cytokine cues and how they respond? For example, can we generate a macrophage that sees these potent immunosuppressive cytokines, IL-10 or TGF-beta, which are abundant in the solid tumor microenvironment, and rather than responding by amplifying immunosuppression, have them respond by um, inducing inflammation. So toward this goal, uh, we, we spent the, the, uh, the last hour talking about chimeric antigen receptors, which again are processors that sense target antigens, and respond with macrophage effector function, phagocytosis, antigen presentation, and so on. Um, can we do the same? Can we make engineered receptors against cytokines? And we've developed a novel platform that we call MCs, Engineered Microenvironment Converters, using synthetic engineered cytokine receptors that fuse um, recognition domains of one cytokine receptor and signaling domains of another cytokine receptor, such that when these macrophages or TAMs see TGF-beta, they respond with inflammation and immune cell recruitment and activation rather than immunosuppression. Now, IL-10 is a pleiotropic cytokine that's upregulated in the TME of a variety of solid tumors. It reduces TH1 responses. It limits antigen presentation, increases PDL1, recruits MDSCs and, and activates Tregs and so on, and is associated with um, a poor prognostic outcome. So we designed an MC against IL-10. And in order to do this, um, what, what Chris did was take the IL-10 receptor uh, and fuse it with the signaling domain of the interferon lambda receptor, which works well because they share a co-receptor. Um, and we now have macrophages that see IL-10 and respond with a type 1 interferon response. We evaluated this, uh, the signaling pathway, um, when macrophages see interferon lambda or any interferon, they signal through STAT1 and STAT2. And we found that when we activate our MCs with IL-10, they are now phosphorylating STAT1 and STAT2 as if they were seeing interferon. We looked at M1 and M2 markers. Um, on the x-axis here is an increasing concentration of IL-10. And then the y-axis is the level of expression of CD86, an M1 marker. If we give control macrophages in gray, IL-10, they downregulate CD86. 
and they upregulate CD163, an M2 marker. Now, if we take MCs that have an IL-10 switch receptor and we feed them IL-10, they're actually upregulating CD86, becoming M1, and failing to upregulate CD163 and failing to become M2, functionally proving that we are able to convert um, the, the, the processing of, of IL-10. We looked at this more broadly. Um, this is uh, cytokine release data with hierarchical clustering. Um, if we look at untransduced macrophages on the right, stimulated with interferon lambda, and we look at their profile of production of chemokines in red and, and cytokines, they, they make a variety of, of these factors. If we take MCs and we trigger them with IL-10, I hope you can all see my cursor, the, you can see that these, these, um, these bars almost perfectly line up. These cells are seeing IL-10 and they're mimicking macrophages seeing interferon. Um, we evaluated the ability of these MCs not only to polarize themselves, but to polarize their neighbors that do not express the MCs. So we took um, macrophages expressing the MCs or controls, we triggered them with IL-10, and we looked at their cytokine release, but we also co-cultured them with either M2A or M2C tumor-associated macrophages. And we found that the M2A and M2C macrophages themselves, even though they don't express the MC, are taking on an M1 phenotype um, and upregulating M1 genes after being co-cultured with MCs in the presence of high doses of IL-10. So not only are the MCs um, converting their own phenotype, but they're impacting their, their neighbors, which of course is critical since if we're using this as, a, say, a cell therapy, the TAMs that are already in the tumor won't express this, only our incoming um, product will. Um, we took this a step further. IL-10 is undoubtedly not the only cytokine target in the tumor microenvironment. TGF-beta is a dominant immunosuppressive factor. We generated an MC that targets TGF-beta and converts the TGF-beta signal into a type 1 interferon signal. And without going through the details, we found the same exact thing. We can target TGF-beta, convert it to an M1 signal. Um, macrophages stimulated with interferon beta, type 1 interferon, upregulated a variety of inflammatory cytokines. If we take MCs and give them TGF-beta, one of the most potent immunosuppressive cytokines, they look just like interferon beta stimulated macrophages. Um, and this is quantified here. I won't go through the details, but they're upregulating inflammatory factors in response to TGF-beta. I should say I failed to mention that not only do they respond to the cytokine with inflammatory responses, but in this process, they're soaking up the, the target cytokine and prevent and pulling it out of the, the environment. So not only are they neutralizing it, but they're functionally responding to it with a desired, with a desired phenotype. We've also made a receptor that converts TGF beta into a CD40 mighty 88 signal, which has a different, um, activates different pathways in the macrophage. And we've shown that this is, um, th this approach is functional. As an example, um, if you can see my cursor, when we give these cells TGF beta, they're now producing IL-12, a potent anti-tumor cytokine. So these uh, receptors, of course, can be combined. They can combine together. They can be combined with CARs, either on the same cell or, or in the mixed cell population. Um, and similar to what I described for, for the CAR macrophage approach, these uh, MCs against TGF-beta or IL-10 and this modular platform more broadly, which can be targeted against specific cytokines, um, can directly convert non-responders into responders when it comes to immune checkpoint blockade. Now, we asked the opposite question. We, we've shown that we can engineer these macrophages to respond to immunosuppressive cytokines with inflammatory responses. Can we do the opposite? Can we generate macrophages that see inflammatory cytokines like interferon and IL-17 and respond with immunosuppression? And the idea here is that macrophages, um, as innate immune cells, they like to go to inflammatory sites. They traffic to inflammatory sites that's been, been shown in the literature. Um, and rather than systemic causing systemic immunosuppression by blocking, say, TNF-alpha or IL-17, can we use macrophage cell therapy to locally home to inflammation, see these inflammatory cytokines, and only when they see the inflammatory cytokine respond with an immunosuppressive cue? So what we did here, similar design, but we took the interferon gamma receptor and fused it to the IL-10 receptor signaling domain. And we found that it works beautifully, the exact opposite response when we give interferon gamma these cells are now downregulating M1 markers and upregulating M2 markers when they express the interferon gamma uh, MC, rewiring the response to inflammatory cytokines. And this, we, we applied this to a different target, 
IL-17, which is found in NASH and CKD and multiple sclerosis and, and others, and found that we can now convert IL-17 into an immunosuppressive um, Q. So I'll stop there. Um, we're excited about this novel approach. I think it highlights that macrophage engineering has broad applicability, not only in the CAR space, uh, but also beyond CARs. And with, the, with this novel MC platform, we expand our target universe from target antigens like HER2 and mesothelin and others, also to cytokines like IL-10 and TGF-beta, and now have, have an approach to target aberrant inflammatory cytokine expression in chronic uh, inflammatory disease. So thank you all for, for your attention. I hope I've convinced you that genetically engineered macrophages are an exciting uh, new approach. And again, I want to thank, um, this is an older picture with about a, a third or half of the team, um, but thank them all for their, for their hard work. Um, so thanks everyone. And if there's time, uh, Judith, I'll be happy to take, take questions. Yeah, and I, we are, we are, uh, we have a number of open positions that are listed on our website. And if you're interested, take a look and, uh, you can reach out to me as well. Well, thank you for, uh, just an amazing seminar. <clears throat> I mean, the progress you've made is so impressive and it's a very exciting technology you've Developed. There are a lot of questions in the chat that I'll, I'll ask, um, but I wanted to ask you first a question directly. Um, since you can engineer the macrophages so exquisitely, is it possible to engineer a macrophage either with a car or a virus to actually express and utilize granzymes in perforins so that you could actually make them directly kill tumor cells the way that T cells do? Great question. Um, my, my answer is I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, if macrophages have the sufficient granular um, equipment to, you know, have those granzyme and perforin um, gran granules and actually release them upon uh, stimulation. Um, mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. I don't know that it's that's ever been done for any for mm -hmm. any cell type. It would be interesting then you could make uh, make these cells completely self-sufficient. Yep. yep. <clears throat> um, so there's a lot of good, good questions in the chat. I'll start from the most recent ones, which probably pertain to the last part of your talk. So um, one question uh, is, um, what are the major challenges for clinical applications given these great advances you've, you've made? Do you see any problems or potential toxicities? Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I went through some. I went through the safety. Um, we don't think that that um, there are. So far, we've seen that the cells have been very well tolerated. Um, we're not seeing any uh, notable safety issues um, in group one of the ongoing study. Um, that said, this is a cell therapy, so you have to be vigilant. The toxicities you worry about are cytokine release syndrome. You worry about um, on target off tumor activity against healthy tissue that shares that target antigen. Um, so I think the same concerns, theoretical concerns from other cell therapies uh, apply here, um, but we have not seen severe CRS and we have not seen evidence of on target off tumor. Um, in terms of what are the hurdles to, to clinical benefit, right, to, to meaningful clinical benefit, I think there are two. Um, number one is, is, is cell number and dose regimen. What is the optimal dose? Um, these cells don't expand like CAR T cells do, where in, with CAR T, there's generally not a dose response because once you give them, they'll expand by orders of magnitude within the body. Macrophages don't expand. The T cells, they prime expand, but they, they themselves don't. Um, so I do think that like for CAR NK, there is a dose response for CAR M and you have to get the dose right. Um, we think that more is better. Um, so with our next um, trial with CTO525, an anti-HER2 CAR monocyte, we're able to increase the number of cells we can make. And we think that with, with more cells, um, there's a, a higher likelihood of, of positive outcomes. The second challenge is T cell exhaustion. Um, we are an antigen presenting cell. We need to have a functional T cell compartment. The T cells are exhausted. They will be limited in their ability to react. Um, so combining with an immune checkpoint inhibitor, we think is, is, is quite important. And as, it, as I mentioned, we are now doing that in the clinic. <clears throat> so uh, what you just said uh, leads me to an, an interesting question. Since you have a CAR macrophage or you can make one in with a virus, um, 
or, or modify the macrophage appropriately with the virus to change the microenvironment, it seems like it would then be advantageous to try to get a CAR T cell directed to the tumor and work. Have you tried that since you're obviously in CAR T cell country? <laughs> yes, um, so it's, it's a great question. Um, can you combine multiple cell types? Can you use CAR macrophages to make the TME more permissive to whether it's a CAR T or, or TCRT? Um, that is something that we're looking at um, with, with collaborators um, it's, uh, early on, but certainly I think the potential is there. Um, you can imagine that when it comes from a logistic perspective, all of these cells are already there in the LUCA pack that you're collecting. So you can separate these cells and manufacture in parallel. So I think there is a path, but of course you have to think about additive toxicities. You have to think about additive cost. Cell therapies are very expensive and complex. So to my knowledge, there has not been a any combination of two cell therapies to date, um, but, um, but but I do think the field will get there eventually. Yes, well, perhaps your virus will combine with the CAR T. Well, then, and then uh, uh, about viruses, are there is there is there any uh, drawback to using the viruses? So. We, we've looked, so the, the, the primary concern when you use a viral vector is, is there any vector in the, pro is there any virus in the product? Um, is the virus, um, the, the viral vector, it's not a virus, it's just a vector. Oh, right, right. And it, <clears throat> can, it, um, can it replicate? Is there any safety concern? So we're, we're very comfortable that there's no safety concern with the vector itself. You do think about immunogenicity. Can the vector increase immunogenicity of, of the cells? Um, and that is that is a viable question. Um, we've looked at this pretty extensively, and the primary, when it comes to adeno, the primary epitopes that T cells react against are hexon and penton in the adenoviral genome, and neither of those are expressed when the vector transduces the cell. So, can there be other non-dominant <laughs> antigens? Certainly, certainly possible, but we, um, th that is something that we're looking at. Okay, great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> so here's an interesting question. Have you tried to target the, these um, particles to the tumor and myeloid cells? I'm not sure I understand, to the actual tumor cells? Yeah, yeah. Whether that some kind of combination thereof would be beneficial. I see. I think that I'm assuming that question is re in regard to our in vivo approach with Moderna, where we directly reprogram in vivo. Yes. Um, the goal there is to generate CAR M, CAR monocytes, CAR macrophages, and CAR myeloid cells, um, and not not to transduce uh, tumor cells. But I, as you can understand, I can't um, uh, talk um, mm -hmm. about, about that program too okay. much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, uh, so. Uh, one comment uh, from Pravesh Gupta from MD Anderson. Um, nice talk. Can you please explain the persistence of CAR monocytes um, beyond a week, which typically is their lifespan? Yeah, so monocytes themselves um, can be. So, monocyte and macrophage survival is an interesting question. And it, it's hard to answer because you can't just sample the blood like you can with T cells. And that's what all the CAR T trials do. They just Take blood every week and you get a beautiful curve. Monocytes, macrophages first, they leave the blood and they go to the tissue. And of course, you can't biopsy normal tissues to look for persistence. You can only look at the tumor. Um, monocytes only circulate as monocytes for a relatively short time, a day or, or, or a few days, depending on the type of monocyte. Um, but once those monocytes extravasate, differentiate into macrophages, they can survive for, for a long time. And there have been studies that, that have looked at this and it depends on where they are, which organ, it depends on what they're doing um, and the environment that they're in. If um, There have been studies showing that monocytes can differentiate uh, into macrophages and take on a tissue resident macrophage phenotype and they can uh, persist for a long time. There have been studies that have shown macrophages um, persisting for over a year in some of the pulmonary alveolar proteinosis literature. So uh, we've seen that when we inject CAR monocytes into mice, we've been able to detect them for over 250 days. Um, what we're detecting at that time point 
are most certainly no longer monocytes, but they are macrophages. The carmonocytes differentiate into macrophages. Macrophages can live for a long time. Oh, <clears throat> yes, I, I agree, but a um, little known fact is that some macrophages can also proliferate. So it would be interesting to know if that's happening here. Um, yep. Many more questions in the chat. Um, if you have time to answer some more questions, perhaps I can um, allow people to ask their questions directly. Um, sure. So go ahead, um, please. We have one um, question from um, somebody whose hand is raised. So please um, go ahead and ask your question, but uh, state your name. We don't know who you are. Yes, this is. Alexander Boyko from Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. Um, great work. Uh, we ourselves work on a CD47 serpal for macrophage um, melanoma field. Uh, the question is you uh, touched on the serpal first as a really irrelevant when you introduce CAR receptors. And my question is how do they overcome serpal CD47 inhibition? But later on, you mentioned that if you delete serpal you increase the efficiency. So how critical is serp alpha CD47 interaction to car M efficiency? Yeah, good question. So all the data you saw today was without serp alpha blockade, without serp alpha deletion, without CD47 blockade. And as you know, all cancer cell lines and, and models express CD47, especially human, human cancer cell lines. So CD47 is present um, in all of the data that I showed, and you can see there is clearly um, activity, efficacy, phagocytosis, et cetera. Um, the question is, can we enhance this further through either CD47 blockade or through direct engineering? And since we have the ability to engineer um, our cells, our myeloid cells directly, can we either use CRISPR or other tools to knock out or delete uh, SERP alpha? And we've presented, I believe, at CITSI some data showing that uh, CRISPR-Cas9 and SERP alpha knockout CAR macrophages <clears throat> demonstrate increased phagocytosis, increased cytokine release, um, and uh, are able to uh, clear tumors in, in, in a, a more aggressive fashion. So there is synergy between those pathways, um, but it's not necessary. In other words, if SERP alpha is there, you, you, you still have activity, you still have meaningful phagocytosis, but you can boost it further with that uh, by by uh, modifying that that pathway. Got it. Thank you. Quick quick question. Just quickly another question. Um, monocyte, of course, and macrophage transduction with viral vectors is a formidable challenge. You overcame it. Have you considered starting with like CD thirty four or iPS cells, which are way more <laughs> easily transducible than antivirus, and then differentiating them towards the macrophage phase? How, how would that, uh, in your experience, would that be easier? So it's it's not necessarily easier, it's different. So if you go to an iPSC, you now have an allogeneic product. So you have all of the, the entire realm of challenges associated with putting one person's immune cells into another person. That means MHC mismatch, that means the risk of rejection and and potentially the limitation of, can you actually present antigens to your T cells if you don't have the right MHC or like most allogeneic iPSC approaches, you've deleted MHC to make a universally accepted immune cell. So it, you enter into a world of different challenges. Um, that said, we are working on iPSC-derived CAR macrophages. We have a collaboration um, with Bruce Blazer at the University of Minnesota, who's one of the pioneers in iPSC cell therapies. Um, and it absolutely is feasible to make CAR macrophages from iPSCs. There have been some publications on that. Um, so it is it is doable and that field uh, is growing. In my mind, there is that primary challenge is antigen presentation. And if you want antigen presentation to be robust, then you have to have fully matched MHC. Um, I think the iPSC macrophage approach or the allogeneic macrophage approach um, is um, immediately um, applicable to, for example, the other approach that I talked about at the end with the engineered cytokine receptors where you're not relying on direct APC function, but you're using these as cytokine processors uh, to skew the tumor microenvironment. And of course, those can immediately be allogeneic um, uh, macrophages. Great, um, we have a question from John scene next. Yeah, great talk, thank you so much. Um, you mentioned the possibility of engineering other types of myeloid cells. I wondered what your thoughts are or if there's any data on 
putting the car, uh, what would happen if there was a car eosinophil or a car basophil or a car mast cell, and um, if, if that has been studied or if there are concerns there? So we're not studying car eosinophils, basophils, or mast cells. Um, so there, I think the, the universe of cell types is undoubtedly expanding from, of course, alpha beta T cells to gamma delta T cells to NK cells, NK T cells. Um, and then to our work on macrophages and, and monocytes, um, I have seen publications very recently around car neutrophils. Um, I've never seen anything around the other cell types. And there has to be a real rationale um, to, to make the effort to go to another cell type. I would say just because you maybe can doesn't mean you necessarily should. There has to be a, a meaningful advantage to the effector functionality and characteristics of that cell type. There's also a key practical consideration, and that's cell numbers. Um, you need to be able to produce a, a, a produce a dose, a meaningful dose. And those other cell types are so rare in the peripheral blood that I think that would be an inherent uh, challenge. But to your question, no, that's not something that we've we've ever looked at. Just out of curiosity, uh, what about dendritic cells? Have you um, tried to manipulate them at all? Um, I think car, so car dendritic cells, I, I think have potential, mm. um, the car monocytes that we're making maintain some of their, um, myeloid differentiation potential, both down the mm -hmm. macrophage and dendritic cell fate, and they are able to make car DCs mm. and those car DCs are in fact, uh, functional. Okay. okay we have a question from Fabio. Qualia. <laughs> okay. Uh, Fabio yeah. is okay. <laughs> yeah, I wonder if you can come say something about uh, how you specifically uh, target uh, the myeloid uh, cells with uh, the LMPs. And uh, when uh, are you, uh, how is the M1 polarization uh, compared to when you use the adenovirus? Yeah, and how important is the, the M1 polarization <clears throat> for the car since M2 also can phagocytose, phagocytate and in theory also uh, present? Yeah, so I, I can't, I, um, I'm not at liberty to discuss any details of our in vivo reprogramming approach um, that we're developing together with Moderna. So I can't answer your first few questions. Um, your last question, which I'll view as more, more general about M1 versus M2, can M2 macrophages still be functional? And absolutely they can, you know, M1, M2 is not black and white. And I, I think everyone cringes a little bit when those terms are used, I use them as a generality, um, but a, absolutely macrophages that are so-called M2, they can phagocytose, they can kill. Um, what I think the primary differences are is the, the, cytok the ability to release inflammatory cytokines um, and what do they do after they phagocytose? Can they cross-present? Can they meaningfully co-stimulate? Do they have a high level of co-stimulatory ligands? Are those outnumbered by suppressive ligands? So I think it's the sequela after phagocytosis. I don't think phagocytosis itself um, is, is um, directly impacted. And there's conflicting literature. There's a paper saying M1s eat better than M2s, and the next one says M2s eat better than M1s. If you look at the details, they're very subtle differences. So I don't, I don't really put too much credibility in one versus the other. Okay, thanks. Um, one more question from uh, Say Luo. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael, for your great talk. And I have a question. When you when you apply the CAR-M to the uh, HER2 positive uh, tumor, and when you inject the HER2 negative tumor, and you find that the HER2 negative tumor will be rejected, does it mean the CARM will cross present the other tumor antigens to the CD8 cells? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So we showed that it's mediated by T cells. We did that same experiment, but we depleted T cells with an anti-CD3 antibody prior to giving um, the HER2 negative tumor and the tumors grew. Um, so it, it is a T cell mediated effect and it is through presenting other antigens to the CD8 T cells. And I think CD4s are likely involved as well. Okay, thanks very much. So I, I, I was uh, really curious about those studies. Have you tried uh, to challenge the mice with like a totally different tumor 
type of uh, another epithelial uh, derived tumor to see whether there's some cross presentation capability. <clears throat> um, we've observed that in some of our studies and uh, there's some suggestion it might be due to an, 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 an endemic viruses that are leading to such uh, cross reactivities. It's a great question. We haven't done it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we haven't looked at that, but it, that's a good suggestion. Yeah. Um, and then there's one question I wanted to ask uh, that, that was raised since I work on cell adhesion, at least in the past. And somebody, uh, so um, Kamal Puri wanted to know whether you have any idea about what adhesion molecules the CAR macrophages use to get into the tumor. And I will say that macrophages change their adhesion molecules dramatically from monocytes, which are definitely streamlined to enter tissues using integrins. Um, so have you looked at that at all? We, it's a good question. We have not looked at that at all. Okay. okay. Great. Well, there are some more questions in the chat and uh, typically we'll um, post them for you on our website if you want to look at them and answer uh, directly. And then um, just a reminder, everybody, that there are a lot of jobs available right now at uh, Charisma. So if you're looking for one, to keep that in mind. I want to thank uh, Michael Klachinski for just an amazing talk. It's a very exciting technology you've developed, and it's just getting better and better. So we, we hope this will work to help patients with cancer and um, provide that breakthrough that we're all trying to get. So. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. So thank you, Michael. Thanks for having me. Thanks everyone for your attention and your questions. Great, okay, take care.